Well, here we are uh, getting suited up, ready to go fly. Uh, I didn't look all the way there. Carl waving at everybody, thumbs up. He's ready to go. Leroy's ready to go. Uh, this was really a, a gentlemanly flight for me. I'm used to getting up at uh, 2 in the morning and getting suited up. Uh, the red team got to sleep in until 7.30 or something. We had uh, virtually no sleep shift at all. We were ready to go, walking out in daylight instead of the middle of the night with lights shining. Uh, bringing up the end here, the uh, guys that like Cleveland an awful lot. <laughs> Certainly for any first time pilot, ascent is the highlight of an aviation career. And here we see the, uh, the three main engines igniting. And from the inside, you can see the vibration that we feel as the main engines light, but before liftoff. Now we'll go back to the outside and you'll see the solid rocket boosters ignite, the uh, explosive bolts fire, and we are on our way. There's no doubt at this point in time that we're going, uh, we're headed out of town. I think the next shot will be from the inside of the vehicle, and you'll get another shot of when the SRBs ignite, and then the, uh, once again, uh, liftoff. Immediately after this, the roll program starts. We can see the horizon out the side windows twisting beneath us, and as we uh, point the nose gently down toward the horizon, uh, we head out over the Atlantic Ocean to the east. Uh, certainly, first stage is a tremendous acceleration, tremendous vibration. It's an exciting ride. At about right now, I was able to sneak a peek out my side window, and already I was able to see the, uh, the sky darken to a deep purple. Uh, during a, a, a summer afternoon launch in Florida, high humidity, so you can see the shock waves, the condensation from the shock waves as we go supersonic, coming off the nose of the vehicle and off the external tank. Uh, in a moment, you're going to see an outstanding view of a, a, something we've never really seen before, and that's a condensation shock right there. Uh, just shortly after that, we have uh, the solid rocket boosters complete their two minutes of thrusting, uh, and they separate from the vehicle. You can see the large plume of smoke, and this is what it looked like from the inside. You can see the, the uh, separation motors fire across the windscreen, and the orange plume come across the windows. From that point in time, for the remainder of the flight, those windows were covered with a residue that kind of hampered our photography efforts from those front windows. Uh, this is the uh, thumbs up. There's Bob giving an enthusiastic <laughs> thumbs up shortly after solid rocket booster ignition. And we are uh, continuing on up to Miko, that's 17,500 miles per hour. <laughs> and you saw Carl recognize the fact that we uh, went through 50 miles, nautical miles in altitude. Here is Miko. And you can see how we move forward in our seats as the three times our normal weight is re uh, relaxed off of us. Here's a view looking out toward the external tank as it is separated from the vehicle. Here's another picture, I believe taken by Don or Leroy. And that's true speed. We're down at, uh, we're coasting uphill from 70 miles uh, altitude at this point. And you can see how fast the world is going by. Uh, once we got on orbit, uh, we opened up the payload bay doors, activated the lab, and uh, went to work for 14 days of uh, exciting microgravity experiments. Here I am uh, headed back through the tunnel to see how the guys are doing back there on a, uh, a turnover between shifts. Uh, most of the time we had two people back in the lab, but uh, twice a day they uh, traded notes to find out how the lab was operating and what was going on. The, the laboratory is just it's a fantastic piece of equipment, and it sure, certainly increases the amount of working volume that you have. This was my first flight with a space lab, and besides the fact that it's the world's finest microgravity laboratory, it was a unique place to work because it's, it's much bigger than just the inside of the flight deck and the uh, mid-deck. You can see all four of us are back here. That's because we're in the middle of a handover. Uh, we're all handing over the notes from the previous shift to the next shift so we could keep up continuous ops. We worked steady in there, in there two shifts a day for the 14 days or so that we had the lab operating. We had about 80 experiments, uh, several of which were life sciences. Two of the life sciences were looking at us as the subjects. Uh, Chiaki's in the lower body negative pressure device, which was managed by folks right here at JSC. And I was the operator on this particular experiment. And then later, it would be my turn to get into the lower body negative pressure device. We also flew a suite of experiments by a Canadian team from Vancouver, uh, spinal changes in microgravity, which was looking at what happens to your body and particularly what happens to your spinal column. It's well known that we get a little bit taller in space. And of course, that means you're pulling on the spinal cord. And this was another experiment uh, that was looking at changes in our ability to perform uh, 
cognitive and uh, motor tasks, it was called uh, PAWS, the Performance Assessment Workstation. And it's uh, somewhat like a video game, uh, but it wasn't fun. <laughs> <laughs> this is the BioRack facility. Uh, it's, it's flown on previous missions, and it's got a centrifuge there to spin some samples up to uh, create a 1G condition. We had other samples in the 0G. And we had many plant and, and small animal experiments in each of these small uh, containers that you see me inserting in there. So we, could have, we had a good 1G and 0G comparison between these two in space. Here I'm doing the micro, uh, uh, looking at the microscope. We have a lot of uh, biotechnological uh, experiments like cell culture and protein crystal growth and free flow electrophoresis. Well, the, the fruit flies that you see here, I watched them every day over the course of the flight. And the ones on the left are microgravity. As Don mentioned, we had the ability to have some in 0G and some in 1G. Tell you what, the ones in 0G quickly learned not to try and fly. Here comes the, uh, the German experiment uh, using very special facility. It's a slow rotating facility. It's a jellyfish to find out its gravitational sense. So we have a lot of life science experiment. Uh, we had more than 82 experiments. <laughs> and this is uh, the goldfish. And some of the goldfish doesn't have inner ear, uh, the organ. So uh, this experiment to find out uh, how fish react to the microgravity and also how fish uh, orient themselves. And here, there is other uh, different kind of fish called medaka, killfish. And uh, the researchers are pretty much excited to find out uh, their mating behavior and also the egg development. And you can see small baby fishes. These eggs are laid on earth and hatched on space. And this is, uh, yeah, and they are developed very well. And also, this is a new experiment. And we have such a very special uh, facility called Aquatic Animal Holding Facility and made by Japanese Space Agency. And this is a newt, and, uh, and these are the baby newt. And uh, researchers are pretty much interested in the inner ear organ, which are uh, usually uh, necessary for uh, the earth condition. So we have such a very uh, lot of uh, life science experiment on board. The other half of our experiments focus on material science, where we were looking at crystal growth and some fluid science. I'm in front of one of the German facilities here called Tempus, which was an electromagnetic levitating furnace. And we had small samples about the size of a marble that you see here heating up and beginning to glow. And as it's melting, you can see it's oscillating a little bit, and its surface is, uh, you can see the oscillation pattern there. And it's a containerless facility where we can heat samples up and melt them uh, and resolidify them without ever touching the walls. This is a, another fluids experiment called the Critical Point Facility. And with this, we're studying the phase transition between liquid and gas. And this facility operated almost 24 hours a day nonstop for the entire 14-day uh, mission of the, in science back in the lab. They even let the commander back in the lab once in a while to help. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, one of our fluids experiments called the bubble drop particle unit. And here we have a heater near the center of this test cell where we're forming bubbles, just heating up the element there and, and forming bubbles like you would on your oven at home. But we can do that in a controlled manner and look how they move under different temperature gradients and uh, how they coalesce, how the bubbles form together here. So you'll see a bunch of bubbles just forming and, and grouping together under microgravity conditions. This is a uh, French electrophoresis unit. It's one of two uh, electrophoresis units we flew. And uh, we were trying to separate different uh, proteins. And you can see up there where I'm pointing up to the control and display screen. And if you look real close, you can see uh, two peaks. This is the electrophoresis cell where the sample was actually injected and uh, the electrophoretic separation performed. Well, as you know, we did a lot of repair in flight. I'm spinning this bag around trying to get the air bubbles out. The big problem with a couple of the units we worked on was that bubbles were in places they shouldn't be. So Jim and I worked together to try and purge the, the Japanese electrophoresis unit of the air. So our first job was to get purge water that didn't have air bubbles in it. So we're very carefully squeezing some out of one bag, sucking it into a syringe. This is the electrophoresis unit, which wasn't really designed to be worked on in space. But in fact, we took it out a total of six times as we tried to purge all the air bubbles out of it. This is one of the uh, medical uh, DSOs or experiments that uh, we performed on the flight. This particular one I'm doing has to do with uh, seeing how the eye and uh, head track targets in the absence of uh, using your inner ear. Uh, I'm wearing a laser on my head, and you'll see a red dot on the mid-deck lockers there. 
as I uh, kind of move it between targets and try to acquire them. And uh, sensitive electrodes will measure the electrical impulses to see how my eyes moved. And an accelerometer also on the helmet unit there will uh, measure the accelerations. Uh, during our uh, flight, uh, we exercised quite a bit. And we were very interested in how the exercise perturbed the uh, microgravity environment. And so we uh, carried the microgravity measuring device, which was built right, right here at Johnson Space Center. And uh, we were able to look at the vibration modes of the uh, cycle ergometer. Jim's heading on down from the flight deck down to the uh, mid deck. We showed you the uh, science on board. Now we're going to show you a little bit about living in space for a long period of time. Uh, of course, the mid decks are uh, our living quarters. It's where we uh, sleep and eat. You can see our sleep station here. Uh, they really woke me up for this picture. <laughs> yeah, th this wasn't staged. We got one at Jim that's a little staged, but we really woke Rick up this day. <laughs> I quickly caught on, however. <laughs> Every morning, like I do at home, I wanted to read the morning news. So this is how we get our morning news in space. It comes out of the TIPS machine. Fantastic uh, machine. It really worked great. But you can see the kind of updates we got. A little bit of that is news, and the rest is changes to what we were going to do each day. <laughs> well, you enjoy your food up there. It's good food. <laughs> <laughs> this was Carl's one task on board, and I've never seen anybody do it better, was keep track of all our consumables, and he's uh, making sure everything's right. Uh, we, we carried the uh, rinseless body baths and uh, shampoo to keep ourselves uh, clean, and they worked surprisingly well. Uh, we were able to, uh, to clean ourselves up real well. It's the same, uh, same baths and shampoos that uh, hospitals use in their intensive care units. Nobody wants to live with somebody that hasn't cleaned up in 15 days. <laughs> I mentioned uh, exercise. Uh, here's a shot of uh, me exercising. Uh, uh, we had uh, some uh, very strong uh, cords that uh, isolated the uh, ergometer from the floor to help damp uh, oscillations. I had a great opportunity to talk with uh, the Japanese student uh, using amateur uh, the ham radio, and it was fantastic. And the day, uh, the people uh, in my hometown were so excited. This shows our PADM operations where we have an opportunity to send messages home. As you can imagine, it, being away from home for 15 days, you get a little homesick, just like going to summer camp. And that was always a great uh, thing to get messages from home. We were fortunate enough to be uh, airborne for the anniversary of Apollo 11's launch and, uh, and the first steps of humans on the moon. And so we uh, had a presentation at uh, the time of uh, those first steps there. Jim mentioned in that uh, still photo the importance of keeping the uh, <laughs> windows clean. <laughs> Jim got so carried away, he was keeping everything really clean. <laughs> But it really was important. Uh, the CAPE gave us a, a fantastic vehicle, and we wanted to deliver it back to them as uh, clean as they gave it to us. And uh, as I said before, we couldn't have got all those uh, great pictures without having clean windows to shoot them out of. Here's uh, Jim getting ready to take some of those pictures while I was talking on Sarex in the background. I'd like to give a tribute to all of our trainers. In this case, the photography training people were able to take somebody who had never ta really taken pictures before, and we were able to return something useful back to the experimenters here. This is Australia, uh, Shark Bay, and then uh, looking uh, uh, toward the upper, uh, upper left portion of the screen, the whole uh, uh, southwest coast of uh, Australia there down to Perth just a, a beautiful view. And this is the Coburg Peninsula in the Northern Territories of Australia. Uh, there's a wildlife preserve attached to it and uh, just a tremendous view. It's, Australia sort of looks like Mars. It has a reddish tinge to it as you fly over it. Here's another shot, this time from the video camera that Bob set up of Hurricane Amelia. I told you how I was exercising on the ergometer, and this came into my, uh, the field of view. At that point in time, Bob was talking to a school in Sarex, and I think by the expression on my face, he knew something very special was happening outside. So while he was simultaneously talking on the ham radio, he fired up the, uh, the video camera, and we were able to get these shots. It, it really was an awesome hurricane. 
This is a, a very special shot. I really enjoy this one. This, we're going over Central South America, and you're going to see some very special things happen. Up here, you're going to see uh, thunderstorms, lightning at night. These are city lights. Now, I want you to look right here, and you're going to see something. Right there was a, uh, a meteorite entering the Earth's atmosphere. You're going to see another one right up here, right there. And we got the opportunity, all of us, during the course of the flight, to just happen to be looking out the window at the right time to see a meteor re-entering entering the Earth's atmosphere from above. And I think that's a, a very special memory. Here's our tribute to the people of the Cape. Uh, months before we launched, they told us to the second when we were going to launch. They gave us a perfect vehicle. And right here, you can see the Cape. That should be the shuttle landing runway right there, the vertical assembly building right there, the crawlway going out to the two pads, our pad being that one right there. I was amazed at the level of detail you could see just with the human eye. And fortunately, all good space flights have to come to an end. And here, Jim and I are finally getting to do some pilot stuff. We're doing the flight control system checkout the day before our first uh, entry attempt. Jim is using a pilot here. It's a little portable computer we had on board, actually a, a workstation that actually has actual orbiter software in it uh, that he can practice landings on. Uh, unfortunately, this is as close as Jim got to landing the space shuttle. <laughs> But uh, when you're up there for a long period of time, it gives you a chance to look at the displays and uh, get your mind set on landing again, what you need to look at and what you need to prepare for for a landing. So this was Jim's uh, one view of landing, and we're going to give you another one here pretty soon. And this is uh, the end of the Space Lab portion of the flight. I'm shutting down the, uh, all the, we, Don and I spent the day shutting the facilities down, and now we're just turning out the last bits of light. and. Uh, Putting up, closing up the hatch that, uh, closing out the tunnel part that goes out to Space Lab. This is uh, just after entry interface. You can see the pink glow out the windows. Uh, Rick said, "Wave at him." He's got a handheld camera. The flashing that you see is from the energized plasma in the overhead windows. The light reflecting off our suits and helmets. And Rick's got the camera, and that's what it looked like out the overhead window. It's just awesome. That's not the tail of the orbiter. Uh, just uh, the whole reentry was at night, and it was just a uh, bright pink glow. You can't quite see it here, but there's little sparks flying by as uh, pieces of the orbiter are heating up and coming off, little small pieces. Here, uh, Very small. <laughs> really small. Here we are coming on, uh, uh, turning on to the uh, heading alignment cone, getting ready to land at Kennedy. And uh, the space shuttle is just an absolutely fantastic machine. It, it launches like a rocket, flies like a spaceship. You can turn it into a space station, and it flies like a super airplane. Here's a little uh, subsonic aero maneuver we did, a little flight test to uh, document the uh, uh, flying qualities of the vehicle, uh, get some uh, aerodynamic data. You can see the VAB out the window there. Uh, transitioning from the 18-degree uh, outer glide slope at 300 knots to our uh, one and a half degree inner glide slope. Uh, we were trying to touch down at uh, 200 knots, about uh, 2,900 feet down the runway. Here we are pulling out about uh, 1,800 feet above the ground in. Uh, Don't miss this. This is my big moment. <laughs> 300 feet above the ground, Jim. That was it. <laughs> Jim lowered the gear. Jim did a great that's, job that's, on that. That's career limiting. If, uh, if he doesn't get those down, I'm going to recommend he gets to fly again. <laughs> and here we are coming in, uh, touching down at uh, runway 33 at KSC. And uh, you're going to see the chute come out here in a minute. Bob said he was supposed to touch down at 200. It was, what, 199.2? Yeah. yeah, I missed by Pretty a close. little less than a knot. The drag chute is just an extremely uh, effective deceleration device. It really slows the vehicle down. I, I did hardly any braking at all. Uh, Jim uh, deployed it uh, at 178 knots. Uh, we derotated at 175, and then at 60 knots, he uh, jettisoned it. And uh, here's a nice wheel stop shop shot, Columbia's home. And uh, it was the end of uh, an extremely rewarding and successful mission.